is Super QE64. Uh, I haven't really done any recordings or anything for quite a while, but uh, I remember I uh, well I did McBat, which I think is the same developer, or at least uh, I probably should have checked that, but a very similar style anyways, you know, classic N64 collect-thon style. Uh, I did that, I don't know, a year or two ago when it came out. And then uh, I just happened to, I don't know, I stumbled across a link to the the ex-Rare devs doing their Let's Play of Conquer. Uh, I was watching that and then this just happened to come out like at the same time. So I thought, okay, I'll, uh, you know, I was in the mood to play it and I thought it would be a good short playthrough. Uh, actually, I have no idea how long the game is. Uh, there's no info on how long to beat or anything yet. But uh, the last game was like the bat was like an hour or two. So I'm assuming this will be about the same. Uh, yeah, just depending on how long it is, I don't know, I usually do, I don't, at like the end of the year I've been doing just kind of a, you know, a talk through of the games I've played that year and stuff like that, so I thought it would be fun to do that. I haven't played very many games this year, so... I may be able to get through them all in this. You know, normally I've been picking a 30 hour JRPG or something, but uh, it's not gonna take 30 hours this time. Uh, so, let's see. All right, I guess this is one of, the, break all the targets is kind of one of the things. Uh, okay, that's cool. Okay, yeah, I didn't know I could do that. Let's see. Anyways, yeah, so the reason I haven't been playing many games this year is uh, I actually just moved to Japan. I uh, started a new job uh, about three months ago. Uh, I was originally supposed to go before COVID, and then... Uh, they shut the border and I wasn't able to go, so then as soon as the border opened back up in March, uh, I started applying for jobs and stuff again. Uh, and of course that took, you know, that took uh, two months or so to get a job and, you know, that's everything like getting a job and stuff, it's so slow because of the time difference from Canada and Japan. Like, I'd send an email at, you know, like I'd wake up in the morning and I'd see that somebody had sent me an email while I was sleeping. So, uh, I'd respond to it, but then of course, you know, 9 a.m. in Canada was like, I don't know, 10 p.m. in Japan or whatever. So, uh, you know, they were only going to respond during business hours for them, so they would respond the next day, which would be, you know, 10 a.m. their day, which was by that time, uh, it would be like, you know, 10 or 11 p.m. or whatever in Canada, so chances are I wouldn't be able to respond then until the next day, so it was basically like, you know, one email response per day. Oh, I, I can just do... Oh, okay. Uh, that's kind of disappointing. I thought I could just do the little uh, pegboard climb thing anywhere. That would have been like, a little bit of freedom, but it looks like it's just the kind of wood structure over there. Yeah, so it took, you know, forever, and... You know, I'd go to have like a meeting with a recruit agent and it would take a couple days emailing back and forth to get a date set up, but it would, because of the limited time, you know, the overlap for when I was awake and when they were at work, uh, 
often the the appointment would be for like a week or two later, and then uh, same thing with interviews. I'd only be able to schedule them in a, in a very narrow time frame, so they were often like a week or two later. All right, I guess that's this level. Uh, and then you know there'd be two or every company would have like two or three interviews you'd have to do. So, uh, you know, and if, uh, you know, it just started, it just took forever. Like you, it'd be when I first applied to a job to when, you know, I got, uh, you know, the sorry, we picked someone else thing, uh, after doing like the third interview, uh, that would be like a month. So, uh, you know, I was doing interviews once or twice a week, but still, uh, it, it took forever. And then, actually getting the visa and everything, that just took, like, forever and ever. Like, we, we applied for the, uh, the visa, and it took, like, a month for it to arrive there, and then they shipped it, and then it took, you know, a couple of weeks for it to get to me, and then... Well, actually, no, it wasn't a month, it was more like, I think it was like two months or something, uh, because they were kind of backed up. But then, yeah, I finally ended up getting over here in September. Uh, so during, like, this whole year, I've just been, like, crazy busy preparing for this, and, uh, you know, both, both like, the finding the job part, and, uh, then they had me doing some work while I was still in Canada, just working remotely. Uh, it wasn't full time; it was just kind of like one project that they were shorthanded on. Uh, but you know, I wanted to like really make sure it was, you know, really, really good. I didn't want them changing their mind or anything. But uh, I actually didn't really have much experience with the stuff they were having me do, so uh, there was, you know, lots, lots of studying. Plus, I was still working for the company in Canada as well, so. Yeah, just, you know, working double and... You know, all that, so... Let's see where do I go. Hmm, I guess, uh, probably all the levels are just gonna be kinda like this, where there's the, the rings, the wheels, or, or the, the cogs, and the, uh, dartboards. I was pretty busy doing that, plus, uh, I didn't play many games this year, but, uh, I did play Elden Ring, which, you know, that of course took, you know, ages and ages to beat. I think I probably spent, I don't know, 150 or 200 hours on it, uh, because I, I pretty much 100% at it, like, uh, I was going through just getting every single thing, and, it was, you know, it was great. I'll definitely, I'm going to talk a bit more about that. I'm going to talk about the games I've played this year, but yeah, that's... If Elden Ring hadn't have come out this year, probably I would have played a fair bit more, you know, different games this year. Okay, so there's the same, uh... The same thing in the other level, but uh, different different symbols. So I'll just kind of remember that that's there. Yeah, so if uh, there was no Elden Ring this year, I would have probably played way more games, but as it is, on my list of games I beat, uh, I've got 11. Well, actually, it's, yeah, it's games I played. Uh, I didn't even beat a couple of them. Which, yeah, normally I've been at least, you know, 30 or so. Uh, so I guess I'll start off, you know, normally I do the top 10 and bottom 10, but uh, I don't even have a completed top 10 and bottom 10, so... Uh, I've got my bottom 2. You know, I guess the, the second bottom one is technically the top best one, but... I thought it fit more in the bottom list, so... Uh, second bottom was uh, Shadows of Adam. The 
this is a game, uh, it was, it's a JRPG, kind of inspired by, you know, SNES JRPGs. I think Mystic Quest in particular, that was what got me interested in it, actually. It came out several years ago, and, like, when it came out, or, you know, before it came out, I heard about it, and I was excited for it, and then it came out, and I bought it pretty much immediately. But I just never ended up playing it, I don't know, it was just kind of, you know, I was busy playing other games, and, uh, you know, I, every time I felt like uh, playing a JRPG, there was a different game I was more interested in playing, or, uh, you know, it just kind of never ended up being the right time. Uh, but I got it on Switch, and, you know, starting work, now, uh, I've had, uh, you know, an hour every day at lunch, uh, so I've got an extra dock and set it up at my desk at work, and I've just been playing Switch games kind of at work. So I got about halfway through, I guess. Yeah, probably, oh, there's the last cog. Ah, uh, this will be the last two things, this and that. Yeah, so I, I got, I think, like, halfway through, and I just, I got sick of it. Uh, it's definitely inspired by Mystic Quest in terms of, like, the graphics. Uh, it's, it really looks like it. I think it looks very nice, and it's got some pretty good music, too. Uh, but I do find it's a bit, it feels a bit bloated. Like, Mystic Quest is maybe eight hours long or so. Uh, but this, I was like, I think 12 or 14, and I think I was only like halfway, so... Yeah, and it's definitely, it's an indie game, so it's got the whole kind of indie... Uh, I don't know what the term is, like, uh, ironic, goofy thing where... You know, you can't just be, like, serious and saving the world or whatever, everything's gotta be a joke, and... You know, the characters have to be constantly doing, like, you know, witty quips in each other and stuff, and... I, I just found it to be just kind of goofy. So that, and, uh... All the characters just talk a ton, like, every cutscene is just more and more... Just, just pointless, you know, goofy nonsense, so... Uh, at first, you know, at first I was reading through all the, the cutscenes and everything, but... Eventually, I just started skipping them because it was like, okay, I just, I just want to get through this, and then, uh, then another game came out, uh, Tactics Over, and I was like, okay, I'm, I'm done playing uh, this. Like, I'd rather be playing Tactics Over than this. So yeah, that's where I stopped. Okay, what do we got here? Sand place. So the, yeah, normally I alternate with the top and bottom, but I don't have enough to do that, so I'll just go with the, the worst game, and that was, uh, you know, I guess, I don't know, it's very close to Shadows of Adam, uh, it's gonna sound kind of trollish, but uh, it was Metroid Dread, so, yeah, I finally got around to playing this, and, you know, I wasn't super interested in it, from what I had heard about it, I didn't think I was going to really like it that much, but uh, I ended up playing through it. Well, I didn't beat the last boss, but I got up to him and... Yeah, I just... It was just way too linear. Okay, here's another simple thing. I should probably be writing those down or something. But, you know, well, if I think I need them all, well, I know where to come and get them. Yeah, it was way too linear, and I know people say, like, oh, you know, a lot of the Metroid games are linear, they just hide it or whatever, but... Uh, if I wanted to do that, just get... It seems kind of like the opposite of what you do. Normally you make the, oh, the lava and stuff go away, so you explore more and not... Thank you. 
But anyways, yeah, it was just, it was just super linear. Um, oh, that's actually a thing I forgot about Shadows of the Battle. It was just like oppressively linear. Like, you know, Mystic Quest is pretty linear, but you can still, you've got freedom to go back and forth. And there's, there's a handful of times when you go back to previous areas to get optional items and stuff. And even though it's really just, you know, you kind of gotta go to the next place, you can't skip out of order or anything. At least you go there, like, on your own choice. But Shadow's Bottom, it was, you know, it, it's hyper linear. Like, you, you move forward to the next town, and then the previous town gets blocked off. And you're really just doing, like, little, you know, segment areas or whatever at a time. You do the, the forest area, and then you get on a boat and go, go across the ocean, and then you never, ever can go back to where you were. Okay. Ah, uh, okay, so if I want to explore down... Oh, what? Okay, that undid the stuff I got. Like, it doesn't save unless you get everything, or... It seems strange. Yeah, so that was just another thing that really put me off it. But yeah, Metroid Dread was also very linear. There was obviously, like, one thing you could do at any time. I didn't like the parry either. I didn't like it in the 2D Metro or the 2DS Metroid, uh, and yeah, I didn't like it here. I just find it doesn't fit into the game very well. Like it's just it's not that kind of game, and that ends up. Uh, it, that takes another button, which the control scheme I found to be a bit overly complicated. Like, it felt like there was just way too many things on too many buttons. I think they should have probably gotten rid of a few actions and kind of streamlined it a bit. Was definitely they focused way too much on making it like hard. You know, in my opinion, the Metroid games like they're about exploring, not about you know one v one fighting bosses kind of thing. But they really, I don't know. I guess with you know, if you want to make a modern AAA game, it's got to appeal to everyone, and people don't like exploring or you know finding stuff on their own. They like just saying that, you know, they're... They, they like pretending that they're exploring. They, they like being told that they're exploring. So that's why, you know, they've got the really hyper-linear game that puts, you know, the barest minimum effort to appearing to not be linear. So that people can, you know, they feel like they're exploring, but they're not actually. bosses they were just I don't know they weren't really interesting or anything they were still a lot of just you know you jump around and you shoot them uh, it was just a lot of them had extremely punishing attacks that take off like a third of your health and you just have to go in and die and then fight them again uh, there was also way too many cutscenes and that's one thing that you know I hate in general but Metroid especially there shouldn't be any cutscenes. My least favorite part of Super Metroid is like that little like five second cutscene at the beginning. And like that's just that one at the start. But uh, Metroid Dread actually had 
a lot of cutscenes and stuff, which... And they were unskippable, too, which... That just shouldn't be a thing. I can't... I can't understand how any company is still making unskippable cutscenes. It just seems like such an obvious, like, you don't do that kind of thing. Oh, and you couldn't remap the controls, which was also really weird. It made it, you know, kind of uncomfortable to play. Yeah, it was just, I don't know. And I got to the last boss, and if I really liked the game, I probably would have kept going, but, and beat the last boss, but I just wanted it to be done at that point. Again, there are no, I didn't play enough to have a full pen. It would be Cosmic Fantasy. Uh, this is a PC Engine. PC Engine CD or whatever. Uh, game. Turbo Graphics, I guess. Uh, the YouTuber uh, GTV did a, like, uh, I don't know, a series of videos on these games. Uh, it was like this multimedia thing in Japan um, where they made like an anime and video games and stuff like that. Uh, and there was like four video games. Uh, so I decided I'd play, you know, the first one just to see what it was about. They've got a very cool... A uh, very cool art style, at least in the cutscenes. Uh, yeah, it's a, I don't know, it's a stereotypical JRPG. Actually, it's a very, very basic JRPG, which, if you think about, like, say, Dragon Quest 1, with how basic it is, this is, like, maybe, like, you know, a, a tiny smidgen more advanced or whatever than Dragon Quest 1. You've got your main character who you control and stuff, uh, and you've got a single uh, partner. But she. Uh, yeah, I seem to remember. I don't know, it was a while that I played a while ago that I played it, but she doesn't really. I don't think she can die. If she dies, she just. You know, she revives at the end of the battle. And I think you have less control over her or something. I seem to remember like it's very, it's very basic. Uh, the yeah, the, the inventory management is pretty bad. Like you, you've got your two characters inventories and then like the main inventory, and you, I couldn't find any way to transfer items like, between them, uh, it seems like once you give a character an item, they have it. Or no, actually, there's no main inventory, there's just the two character inventories. And there's no way to transfer items between them, as far as I can tell, at least. So I actually, I almost got stuck at one point, because, uh, the girl had the ability to cure petrification, a spell, and she was also holding, like, my cure petrify item, and then she got petrified, and the hero has no magic, 
and he had no petrified cure item. And I had like saved at this town that didn't have the ability to cure petrification. So I had to basically save Scum my way through because like he has no magic and he can't heal, so he just dies basically over time if you get in enough fights. So I had to save Scum my way through to get to a town that actually had the Petrify Cure item. Which, yeah, that was, that was not good. But yeah, it's an extremely basic game. Not bad, just it's bare bones as anything. Which is weird because it came out years and years after Dragon Quest. The, the tiles and sprites and stuff, like outside of the cutscenes and like character portraits, are absolutely hideous. Like, they just look... they're the, the absolute worst I've seen ever. But yeah, like the... it, w it was like a CD game, so it had like pretty nice uh, like anime-style cutscenes and stuff. And, you know, the actual the story and stuff was pretty good. So yeah, it was... I don't know. I'd say it was okay. I wouldn't like recommend it to anyone. There's a million better JRPGs, but it was interesting to play just as like an oddity. Uh, plus, I've never—I don't think I've ever played a game uh, for that system before. Uh, so next was PictoQuest. This was a—I played it on Switch. It's basically uh, Sudoku. Or no, not Sudoku, um, Picross. Uh, it's Picross, but it has like, uh, it has some like items and it, it sets it up as like as if you're playing against like monsters and stuff, so uh, you'll take damage as time goes on or you get incorrect or whatever, but you can use items to uh, heal or freeze the enemy and stuff. Uh, kind of like how there's Tetris variations where you play against people. Uh, and you can like throw garbage on them and stuff. It's kind of like that, uh, and it's a you know JRPG theme. So you you make pictures of potions and swords and stuff like that. So it, yeah, it's it's just Picross basically. I've played a couple of Picrosses and they're fun. And I felt like playing another one. So uh, there's quite a few on the Switch. Next was seven uh, Dragon Quest Builders too. I played Minecraft uh, like last year, I think it was, and I had a somewhat mixed review of it. Like, I was really, really looking forward to like the whole survival exploration aspect of it, but there was a couple of flaws. Like, I hated the mining and the crafting, and uh, a couple other things about it. So when I heard about Dragon Quest Builders, I thought, okay, this this could be Minecraft, but with like the parts I hate stripped out. So I got it, you know, as soon as I kinda like heard about it, I went I bought it pretty much instantly and then started playing. And I did somewhat like it. I did, yeah, I liked it a fair bit, but there was a couple problems with it. Uh, so yeah, it was, it was in the Dragon Quest world with Dragon Quest items and characters and stuff, which is good. And it was fun to be a bit more, like, kind of RPG-oriented, where... I don't know, there was a bit more emphasis on the survival aspect and making a base and stuff like that. And, more monsters that you had to fight and stuff like that, so... That aspect of it was fun, but... It is just... It's extremely hand-holdy. It's one of, like, the most hand-holdy games I've ever played. Like, even... 20 hours into the game, you still get these long-winded tutorials where go to a new area and they're like, okay, we need to build, I don't know, a drink bar or whatever. So instead of just saying, you know, hey, build a drink bar somewhere in this city, in this new city or whatever, 
they're like, okay, uh, you know, we need you to build a drink bar. So first, to build that, you're going to have to go collect ore or whatever. So then, they don't just leave you to go get the ore. The character walks over to the mining place and then points at a specific rock and is like, okay, mine that, and then you mine it, and then they say, okay, you got one ore, we need nine more. And then they point to like nine other specific rocks, and they're like, go, go mine those. And then you pick up the other nine, and they say, okay, good, now you can make uh, a drink bar. Go over to this specific crafting station, now press B or whatever to open the menu. Okay, now, uh, there's the thing here. Okay. Now, you know, craft the table, okay, now take the table and put it over on this very specific uh, block. And it's just like that all the way through. Every single bit of it is just completely do the exact thing at the exact spot. And even between, like, when you think, okay, I'm, I'm done that little bit of story, and they give you a mission, just, you know, build up your city until it's at certain size with this many special buildings or whatever. And you would think, okay, I'm completely free now, I can do what I want. But they still just randomly limit you, like, the whole area will be uh, really, you know, really big. Like, if you imagine in this area here, okay, we've got, like, you know, all this land and stuff, but we can only build on this one little tower that I'm in. Like, you can't, you can't build over there. It just doesn't let you. Or if you do, if you can build over there, it just doesn't count. Even if you build there, it doesn't, it never, it doesn't count for what you need to build and like the villagers won't use it you can build a, a house over there they won't go over and sleep in the bed or anything it's just a ridiculously hand-holdy of limiting like they they just assume everybody playing it is an idiot or something I would have absolutely loved it if it was just more, if it was just, hey, here's the, here's the world, uh, your goal is to go and, you know, defeat these six bosses, they're somewhere in the world, and, uh, you know, you also have to make, you know, 50 buildings or whatever, you know, and here's a list of specific buildings you have to make somewhere and just, you know, go about it however you want. That would be great. It would be one of my favorite games probably of all time if that was the case. But it just, it just wouldn't let you play. Next was Armada no Kiseki. This is a Famicom Disk System game. Uh, and it's it's got like the whole kind of Indiana Jones style, uh, you know, imagery. Uh, and I I love Splunker. I love uh, La Mulana. So as soon as I saw it, I was like, I gotta play this. And it's not really anything like those two in terms of gameplay. Well, they're not really like each other either, but. Uh. Yeah, it's basically, I don't know, it's a side-scrolling, well not really side-scrolling, kind of like a free hallway-scrolling platformer. You go through like these, these complicated side-scrolling levels, but you go kind of up and around and back, and, and you've got a grappling hook, so you'll... Uh, 
you traverse all over the place. Uh, and you also pick up bombs and da throwing daggers and guns and stuff. So it plays kind of like, I guess, maybe Bionic Commando mixed with Ninja Gaiden. Uh, it is really difficult. I didn't end up finishing it, but I did like it a lot. So I you know, definitely recommend that. I know the Famicom, Famicom Disk System games, they seem to be a bit more difficult to find. Like, you know, not every ROM set has them all in it or anything, but... Uh, it was apparently, I think, released on the Wii Virtual Console in Japan as well. That's one way of acquiring the ROM. Yeah, it's... Yeah, it, it was really good. Uh, next is Contra. Uh, so I played through with the Contra code because I'm pretty bad at action games. But this was just one that, uh, you know, I'm always reading about uh, retro video games and uh, you know, watching videos. I've s I've seen countless videos like AVGN and so on about Contra. And, uh, Castlevania and stuff like that, so I just thought uh, I gotta play it. Like it, it's Contra, you know. I love this kind of thing, so uh, you know, how have I just not played Contra? And yeah, that was just one of those games I just didn't have as a kid. Uh, I did have an NES, and I had other games at that time, but it's just I don't know. I just didn't get it. And back then, you. you if you just didn't happen to have a game, you just, you didn't even know it existed often. You just, you never played it. Oh, that was... Okay. So yeah, I finally played through it. Uh, I used the, yeah, the Konami code. Uh, but other than that, I did beat it. Know, legit or whatever, I didn't save scum or anything. Uh, yeah, it was just really good. Uh, I'm not sure what else to say. Uh, I guess, yeah, I... Oh, need to die. oh okay. Uh, I know a lot of NES games, there's just this kind of like meme going around that they're all just insanely hard, you know, garbage basically, where you expect to just go in and then you just die over and over again and you, you spend 50 hours just repeating the same three levels over and over before you can beat the game and, but Contra is not like that it's it's well balanced and there's a reason why it's as popular as it is Uh, next was Maneater uh, for the Switch. This is a game that it looks really bad. Uh, you know, if you well, I mean, I don't mean visually. I mean just kind of in general. It looks like kind of uh, you know a really budget kind of trashy game where you know. It would just be worthless, but it was actually really fun. I ended up, I just, I got it as a gift, and uh, otherwise, yeah, I probably wouldn't have picked it out myself. But it was actually really fun. You just play as a shark that you go around and you eat other animals and people and stuff, and get bigger, and then uh, then you eat bigger animals and stuff. Uh, it's kind of RPG light. You've got levels and different body parts you can put on and. Stuff like that. It's not terribly long, I think it was maybe 15 hours or so. Uh, you just kind of free roam around this resort area and eat all the people and fish and stuff in the area. Uh, you know, eventually you're eating bigger, you start off eating little fish and stuff, then you eat alligators. I don't know, then small whales, and eventually you're, you're killing like blue whales and stuff. Uh, yeah, it was... It's definitely got kind of a budget feel, but it was it was really fun.
Uh, it kind of reminded me of Evo for the SNES. Next was uh, number three, Symphony of War. Uh, this just kind of came out of nowhere. I was just suddenly like, I don't know, I read something like, oh, you know, Symphony of War is out today. It's a, it's inspired by Fire Emblem and Over Battle. And I absolutely loved Over Battle. Uh, I played that just like crazy back on the N64. over and over. I got all the endings and everything. Uh, that was one where, uh, yeah, I was in like middle school at the time and I didn't have a printer or I don't think I even had a computer at the time. Uh, so during library class, I went in to the library and uh, I went to, I think it was CheatCC, it was the website. I think it's, I don't know if they're still around, but uh, I found a uh, a player's guide for it. And it was something like, I don't, you know, several hundred pages long of text. And I just went and I waited till the teacher was gone out of the room. And then I, I went and I just printed the entire thing. Just, uh, the printer just kept spewing them out. And I was like, you know, standing at the door watching for the teacher to come back. I'd probably get in really big trouble if I just did that. And, uh, yeah, the entire thing, I printed it out. I had this huge monster guide of the whole game and all the stats, and the, uh, you know, the damage formulas or whatever, just everything. Uh, so yeah, but there's, there's not really many games like Ogre Battle. Like, there was one I played on the PS4, I think it was, it was like Grand Saga or something. And, uh, I think it did eventually come out uh, in the West, but I, I had imported the Japanese copy. Uh, I kind of had some problems and I didn't end up really finishing it, plus I don't know, I find it kind of a bother to play on the PS4. I much prefer PC or Switch or whatever. Uh, and there's, I don't know, like the Total War games are kind of vaguely similar, I think, but... And I love them, but uh, other than that, there's just, there's nothing like Ogre Battle. So, uh, when this came out, yeah, I was pretty hyped to hear that, so I just bought it immediately, played through it, and... Yeah, it was just great, like, if you like Ogre Battle... Uh, now, it's not, like, real-time movement, uh, it's... I bet he's gonna high laser me or something. No? It does have some, you know, there were some things I didn't really like about it, uh, some kind of, I don't know, minor kind of problems, but, uh, uh, well, uh, one thing was the art style. The art style is just all over the place. The, uh, the character portraits are done in, like, this kind of, like, really... You know, Western artist trying to be anime kind of style. Uh, the, I don't know, they're kind of like, yeah, halfway between trying to be anime and trying to be like, I don't know, Game of, uh, not Game of Thrones, but, you know, like, seri like uh, fantasy novel kind of art or whatever. Like from like D&D &D or something. It's... I don't know, it's that kind of art style, uh, except the, I don't know, I guess it's like the artist thing or something, but the, I don't know, the women are all, like, they all have massive tits, like, you know, every one of them is just gigantic, and they're also, they tend towards being, like, really muscular, 
like usually more than the guys uh, and there is like one specific female character who she's just you know she's just super macho and then she eventually gets like even bigger where she's just like this giant like the Hulk basically uh, which yeah uh, like that's whatever but um, and it's not it's not a terrible like art style or anything but it's not it's not super great Oh, and it does definitely feel like, you know, indie game developers who they hired kind of whatever artist they could afford kind of thing. Or, you know, their one college friend who was an artist. Okay, uh, this definitely feels like there's some kind of hidden backstory lore thing that's going on. Like, it's not just you know, typical 3D platformer, grass world, water world, fire world, desert world kind of thing. Uh, so yeah, that's that art style. And then the, the actual sprites are like the, the sprites during the the cutscenes and stuff that are walking around, like the, the standard JRPG style sprites, they they have got to be um, like game maker sprites or whatever. Like they that's if that's not what they are, that's exactly what they look like. They look like the standard stock game maker kind of sprites. Uh, so they don't fit with the other with the portrait sprites at all. And they don't look that great either. Like again, they're not bad. They're not terrible, but they look like game maker sprites. Okay, I thought that was gonna kill me or something if I went in it. Uh, and then you've got the. Uh, the battle sprites, which they look like Fire Emblem sprites exactly, like uh, when they're doing their battle animations. Uh, they almost look like uh, uh, like you know, like they traced the Fire Emblem sprites or something. I I'm not saying they did or anything, but it looks they you know completely mimic that style. So the problem is all these three styles they. They don't fit at all with each other. Like they they all look like they're from completely different games. Uh, that was kind of my only my major problem. The other thing is it is it is kind of simplistic. It doesn't have as much uh, variety and stuff as the Overbattle games, which uh, you know I guess it's small indie team first game kind of thing. So. That's understandable and everything. Um, yeah, it was... Uh, yeah, it was really good, and I was glad to play another battle style game. And I'm hoping that, you know, this does good for them and they make another one. Uh, I know they are still continuing to update it, but... Like, I beat it, and I'm not really terribly interested in just playing through it again, but... Yeah, if they... If they make another one, I'm definitely getting it. Uh, so next was Chrono Trigger. Uh, this was one I played, you know, end of year last year. I think I technically finished it in the new year, so... Uh, yeah, it was, it was great. Uh, glad to finally play through it all the way. I'm uh, not really going to talk about it much because I spent 30 hours talking about it. But yeah, just glad to get through that. Uh, then, you know, the number one game of the year, Elden Ring, of course. I think I had probably talked at length during the Chrono Trigger about like my thoughts on the Soul series and how 
you know, they've, in my opinion, kind of been going downhill. Like, I didn't really like Dark Souls 3. I only beat it one and a half times. Uh, I didn't even finish Sekiro. Uh, in my opinion, they're just not... They don't do action well enough to make an entire action game. And that's kind of what they've been leaning towards. So you've got Dark Souls 3, where it's it's just basically an action game. It's really... it's pretty linear. All the bosses are just 1v1 fights in an arena against a big monster or a guy. Uh, they've kind of lost the whole you're an explorer exploring a big dangerous world all on your own kind of thing. And so yeah, I was really excited for Elden Ring and it it did live up to it. Uh, I'm glad they, they really went more towards, you know, you're just exploring and uh, there was some bosses that were, yeah, they were fighty uh, 1v1 bosses. Uh, Blenia, I think she's the worst boss in the whole series. Uh, oh no, oh no. Uh, she just doesn't fit. Like, she nullifies basically every strategy. Like, you can't tank her hits with the shield because she blocks them. You can't really summon because the summons just feed her HP. Uh, and so on. It's just, you know, you dodge her and you counterattack, and that's it. That's the only valid strategy, really. Uh, aside from a few really cheese strategies like spamming blood flies or whatever. Uh, but aside from that, yeah, I was really glad it's just, you know, it's open world exploration, Dark Souls, which that's what I've been wanting for a while. Um, the only thing I do think, because it is so open and so big, uh, like when I beat Dark Souls 1, I immediately started a new game, but I haven't played Elden Ring since like I finished it. And I never ended up making a second character, just because it is so big that with Dark Souls 1, like, it's kind of small enough that you can keep the entire game in your mind, so, or at least, uh, you know, if you want to go through another run, you can kind of keep the whole game in your mind, and you can be like, okay, I... You know, I'm doing a mage, so I gotta get all the spells, so this is where I get a good mage sword, and th these are where all the relevant spells are. But Elden Ring is just, it's too big, you just can't do that. And I'm not gonna do another, like, explore every single dungeon. Uh, you know, full run through again, because I, you know, I don't want to spend another 200 hours on it. But yeah, the first time through was definitely, like, it, it was amazing. Uh, it's just, yeah, less, I'm not going to be playing through it as much uh, over and over. Probably in a couple years or whatever, I'll play through it again. But yeah, it's very, it reminded me a lot of Breath of the Wild in that way. That I played through Breath of the Wild like crazy. Uh, I did basically everything, and then I didn't touch it for years, and then it was, you know, a while ago I went through and I did, I played like halfway through again, just for, uh, you know, kind of relive it a bit. So I am, yeah, I still like Dark Souls, and Dark Souls 1 and Demon Souls the best. Those are still my favorite FromSoft games, but I would definitely put Elden Ring just after them. Yeah, so that's basically, uh, okay, I got a bit more here. Uh, okay, I got seven and eight, and then the airplane, I guess. I'm almost done.
Yeah, so I'm not sure what else to the top of the Oh, oh uh, I did do my usual souls thing. Uh, usually when I play in the souls game, I like doing just a complete balance. Um, Still, like uh, strength and dex and into faith, all kind of leveling up more or less in play. Uh, which I know that's, you know, if you're doing PvP or whatever, that's useless. You, you just end up uh, being absolutely terrible if you do that. But uh, for, the act for the single player, I find that just to be the most fun, especially for a first playthrough, because. Because it means you've got all sorts of new tools, like you've got you've got miracles to heal and cure stats ailments and stuff. You've got some spells to do damage and uh, you can use a variety of different weapons. But you're not super powerful in any one thing, so you're not just gonna be like if you're doing a strength build, the entire game becomes dodge roll then jump R2 or someone. Or if you're doing just like a pure in build, the entire game becomes spam, soul arrow, or whatever. Uh, but if you're doing the, the mixed build, you can really, you know, tailor your your skills or whatever for like the fall in that hand. Yeah, that to me really makes it feel like the, you're an adventurer exploring and you've got your set of tools and you you can't just overpower everything, you've got to use your tools and kind of think about what you've got to do. Especially with Elden Ring, it, give, it gives you so many more different things you can do, like there's so many more different spells and you've got uh, summons. That was a lot of fun. Uh, coincidentally, I did end up. Uh, I got the Sword of Night and Flame, which was uh, at the time when I was playing through it. It's probably been nerfed by now, but it was like one of the most powerful weapons because it's got like this Kamehameha attack where you know it just it one shots basically anything, like one or two shots. There's several bosses where the battle would just be like I go in, I instantly. Kamehameha them, it takes off three quarters of their health, and then I, you know, they jump around a bit, and then I hit them with it again, and they die. Uh, which was, I don't know, like, I don't really care for the bosses, it's like, you know, a test of your skills, 1v1, one one, um, dodge roll, and then counter attack. I don't, I find that to be completely pointless. If I wanted to play like a good action game, I would just go play an action game. You know, like the when you're one v running a boss in a, in a single, you know, one on one in a single arena with no obstacles or whatever. There's not really any reason to be playing Dark Souls and not playing like Bayonetta, the Devil May Cry, or something like an actual good action game. So, you know, I, some people say, like, oh, you know, you, you're cheating yourself if you use summons on bosses or whatever, like, you're not experiencing the actual, you know, the dance and flow of the combat and memorizing the techniques and stuff, but I just, I find that all pointless, like, I'd rather be exploring or having bosses that are actually interesting and, you know, you've got to think and prepare and stuff, or not just dodge roll in R1. Like, I see basically no difference between Millennia and Artorias, Pontic Sullivan, I don't know, 
most many of the Bloodborne bosses, all many of the secular bosses, they're all just you dodge, you dodge and you are one number. And it doesn't matter what weapon you're using or what your build is, it's you know, dodging and then hitting them once with your greatsword for 200 damage, or hitting them four times with your dagger for 50 damage each. It all ends up being the same, so I, I much prefer the more interesting bosses. Lady Astraea, or Maiden Astraea, or uh, even like Sif is at least interesting unit. He's a fairly uh, average combat encounter. But actually, many of the Demon Souls bosses I, I like a lot because they they do tend more towards that kind of uh, interesting, just straight combat. And you know, Elden Ring did have a fair bunch. Of a fair bit of just straight combat bosses, but it has enough, you know, enough different things that even if the game wants you to just 1v1 dodge roll and R1, you've got enough different things that you can kind of like break it and force it to be something else. If I hit this, it's like the water gonna rise and I'm not gonna really get that anymore. Oh good. Played it non-stop. You know, this was eight hours a day or whatever it felt like. I guess the thing that, that thing. I know there are, there's going to be plans for DLC apparently, or everybody thinks there's going to be, uh, so, you know, I don't, I've heard there's going to be a multiplayer focus, I, I can't stand the multiplayer, so I'm not going to be doing any of that. And, you know, like, I've beaten it, uh, the DLC does, well I'm gonna get the DLC probably anyways, but, you know, just for like the next time I play through the game, but if the DLC does end up being just, uh, you know, a multiplayer arena and then like some fairly standard, uh, I don't know, Legacy Dungeon, I don't know if I'm gonna be... Cutscene appearing late as in midair there kind of screwed me up. If it ends up being just kind of a standard legacy dungeon or whatever, I don't know if I'm gonna play it because their their DLC, while it's been good, they've tended towards like the really you know hyper tough one v one fights. Like they're gonna, I bet they're gonna try and top me up with like, annoying. gonna fight like Millennia in her prime or something. Yeah, I don't know if I'll end up playing through it anytime soon or not, but uh, I am hoping we get another Souls game announcement. Uh, and not for PS5, I, I don't really want to buy it. I do actually have room in my apartment. Uh, when I moved to Japan, I was really worried I was going to be in like, uh, as you know, a little tiny one-bedroom apartment that was like a thousand dollars a month or something. But actually, I'm paying like I don't know, like six hundred a month for I don't know, it's like seventy square meters, 
60, yeah, 60 or 65, I think, square meters, so it's, it's pretty big, like, it's, it's plenty big enough for anything I'd want to do. I've got plenty of room for all my hobbies, and, uh, if I wanted, I've got enough room to set up, like, VR, and, uh, you know, I could get, I could get a PS5, and set up a VR and everything, and, yeah. Uh, I just, I don't really want to get a PS5, because, like, my PS4 was basically, I don't know, it was Bloodborne, and a couple other games that, you know, I kind of played because I had the PS4 and they weren't available on anything else at the time, like, you know, Neo, Neo 2, but, oh no, no, oh good, I thought it crashed. I, I really don't want a PS5 because it's just it's money I can be putting towards like literally anything else. So I, I'm really hoping it's not a PS5 exclusive, whatever they do. Or if they, you know, if they make Sekiro 2, I don't care. I'm, I'm not buying it anyway, so they can be PS5. But I really don't want like a you know, Demon Souls 2 on a PS5. Oh yeah, I guess that's... There's one more game that's... Uh, Tactics Over War. I'm, I'm still like midway through it, because I've just been playing on my lunch breaks, so... It's now that I've been able to it. Yeah, I... I love the, the Night of Lotus on GBA. And I played through the game, uh, Super Nintendo Tactics Over on emulator at some point, and it was good. And I played through, it was maybe five or six years ago, I played through the PSP pack of Silver, and the, the two things I didn't like are the leveling, where everybody, all the classes leveled at once. That was just, it was just weird. Like, uh, you can level up pretty quickly in Tactic Silver, I think even in the PSP version, so I don't think it really made, made a big difference. Like, you you change someone to a class nobody's used and they're level one and then you go and you fight one random encounter and now they're they're leveled up the same as everyone else. So it didn't really matter, but it was just weird. It was just one of those things that bugged me that I just I couldn't get over. It's kinda like, you know, if you had a uh, You've got all your different classes, and they all specialize in different things. But you can imagine it being the case that, like, archers were really, really good at close combat. Like, just the abilities they got, they just accidentally made them good at close combat. Say, like, their... Their bows were... The damage dropped off, like, exponentially with distance or something, so... You could hit an enemy from the other side of the map, but just the way the damage worked damage formula worked. If you did that, you did like one damage, but they didn't like cap the close distance, so cap the close range or anything, so if you shot them when they were next to you, you did like you know, a thousand damage, you just one shot of them. If you can imagine that in your face, and so archers were running around, like basically melee killing other enemies. And then, say warriors, say warriors were really good at the first zone's ability. Like, they got some buff to it that was just disproportionately good. And so you had warriors going around, those zoning everyone to death from a range. And like, you know, maybe warriors, they've got good armor, but the armor doesn't really matter the way the damage calculations work. But archers are really good evade, so they can effectively tank, you know, dodge all melee. You can imagine the game being set up that way. Archers were really good at uh, long range and melee. Or, or archers were really good at melee and warriors were really good at long range. But it could still be balanced. It could still end up being that okay, archers aren't just better than melee, better than warriors all around. You still want to have a, a variety of 
not like it. But it would be weird. Just having it be like a cartridge or a bit of beta like this. It could be completely balanced, completely fine, it would just be weird. And that's the kind of thing that just bug me and I just I wouldn't be able to play it. And that's kind of how I felt about the leveling system. It was, maybe it was completely balanced, and if you could look at it objectively or whatever, it, was, it made sense. But I just couldn't get past it. And the other thing was the uh, crafting system. That's, I've, I've never seen a good crafting system in the game, and this just felt tacked on. Like, I don't know, maybe like Minecraft is at the peak of its popularity at the time or something, but it felt like, okay, we, we've got to have a crafting system because games have crafting systems now. And it ended up just being a whole bunch of tapping to get stronger. If you go and you want to make your long sword into a long sword plus one to get extra 10 damage or whatever. And that's like the optimal thing to do, so you're kind of pressured to do it. But to make the long sword plus one, you need a, say a, a steel plate. To make the steel plate, you've got to first craft, uh, say, 10 steel ores. And for each steel ore, you've got to craft like 10 steel nuggets or whatever and every one of these has to be done individually and there's a long unskippable animation for each of them so to do the optimal thing and make your long sword and your long sword plus one you've got to spend 20 minutes just sitting there tapping around in menus and it was just it was just horrible But uh, those were the two things that they, they heavily advertised with the uh, Reborn, that they weren't doing that. They, they fixed the crafting, so now uh, you just say, you know, you click on the longsword plus one and it just auto-crafts everything in between. Which, I still don't think it's a good mechanic. Uh, my... Uh, I would have preferred they actually make the crafting an actual like mechanic of the systems and stuff. Maybe you know you get different slots on different items and they have different kind of competing effects. So you know one one will increase the damage or decrease the range or you know increase the RT or whatever. Um, got to kind of like fit them, fit different pieces in like a puzzle or something. They could have made it an interesting thing, but I guess if it can't be good, at least it can just not be, which is basically what they did, where it's just you go into the menu and you select your longsword and then it becomes better, and that's it. So, but yeah, if it's not going to be good, at least make it as unobtrusive as possible, and that's what they did. They also fixed the leveling, so, or, you know, they made units level on their own, which... Yeah, like I said, I don't think it really made a huge difference. Uh, as it is, everybody is just max level all the time. Uh, because depending on how far you are in the story, your units have a max level. And they gain so much experience that everybody's just max level. doesn't really matter. I guess this is another case of if it's not going to be good, it just isn't, and that's at least better. You know, something that doesn't exist is something that gets better than something that's bad. So, yeah, it's not really a huge deal or anything, but I'll really fix that. And see, I'm, I'm having fun with it. I don't know if I'll, I'm not going to be finishing it before the new year, so I'm going to be in my next year then, but, uh... Yeah, it's, uh, it's 
spawn. Uh, related to that, actually, when I heard about the announcement, I got kind of more interested in Tactics Over, and uh, there's a couple of mods that I've been wanting to make for Night of Orbits uh, for a long time, like year, probably, I don't know, like 15 years ago, maybe, I remember, uh, you know, messing around in an emulator trying to accomplish something. But, uh, yeah, so I've gotten into, like, ROM hacking it a bit. Uh, unfortunately, there doesn't seem to be any good GBA debuggers, so I've been kind of limited in what I can do. It's mostly just been simple, like, memory changes. Uh, not actually writing new code or anything. Uh, if it was an NES game, I could totally do that, but... Ah, uh, okay, this is what I do. But yeah, I've been kind of limited to just changing memory values, but there are a few things I think I can accomplish. Uh, one is that uh, Rudgum from the PSP game is actually in Night of Lotus, uh, so I want to just make a mod to restore him. Uh, he's got some dummy out values and stuff that I'll have to fix, like he doesn't have a description and uh, his special class is kind of broken and stuff like that. But... I'll probably make a standalone mod to fix that. There's also... Uh, there's character, or classes that are in the game and they're like 99% functional. You just can't acquire them. Like the, the bandit. Uh, I touch this one. Like the bandit, the duke knight, uh, and so on. Uh, the daemon, the dark angels. Uh, zombie knights. Or all the zombie classes, basically, uh, and so on. Uh, so I want to make a mod that makes every every functional class obtainable. Ah, uh, I bet I pushed this. Over. So in, you know, in looking for stuff that will allow me to do that, I have made, I have found uh, I can make the non-recruitable classes recruitable, so you can go and you can recruit two knights and stuff like that. Uh, and there's plenty of slots, like uh, in the random encounters, where I'll be able to just put you know, a Duke Knight or a Bandit or whatever in each of the random encounters, so you can go and repeat that for a few them. Uh, I've also found the table for hiring enemies, or hiring characters. I know I'm missing something, I'm pretty sure it has to do with that. But, I don't know what to do. Oh, I got it. Okay. I was jumping out of the water before it was faster, but that makes sense. Uh, so yeah, I, I could change the recruitable characters. Like, currently you can include Octopus and Cerberus and so on. Uh, I can change those. The problem is I haven't found how to how it selects which one, so I would like to be able to make it that, you know, it selects which care which class you include based off, say, some other number. Like, currently it uses a table and it, it somehow randomly generates which entry into the table, but I want to make it just like some other value, that way any class within bounds will be selected. But I'm just, I'm not sure exactly how to do that. Uh, I might have to install like Gidra or something. Apparently you can debug fairly well with it. Okay, so I did 
did those. Uh, yeah, so I want to, like, if you could hire any any class, that would be one good way of doing it. Or, you know, have it randomly pick from any class. But the thing is, I do, I can't just pick, like, you know, 0 to 255 or whatever. It's got to be bounded to specific ones. And I also, I want it to be just the ones that aren't normally obtainable. I don't want, like, dragoons or whatever showing up in there. I want it just to be those characters, so yeah, I'm, I'm not sure what I'll do there. Uh, I might just go on, you know, recruiting or whatever from enemies. So yeah, I'm definitely I'm gonna do that as a mod, and I also I want to make a randomizer. I've currently got a very simple randomizer working where it just it basically just randomizes all the classes. Uh, it's not very fun though because you know you end up with just classes with nonsensical weapons like characters that because they keep their old equipment so you get like wizards with swords and knights with staves and magic they can't use and stuff like that but uh, I, I want to kind of add a bunch of logic to that So yeah, I don't know when I'll finish it. I've kind of been working on it on and off. Uh, I worked on it too much and it kind of hurt my wrist. So I've been, aside from work, I've just been not programming because it, it hurts my wrist. Uh, but it's been getting better. sometime. I, I've been at least, uh, I want to at least, you know, finish something, finish the, the Recruit All Classes mod and the Rudlam mod because, you know, then I've got something to show for it because I have spent a lot of time just, you know, looking through hex values and all this and I've, I've got all sorts of tables and stuff figured out, so. Okay. gotta be something. But, uh, I have no idea what it is. And I don't really feel like figuring it out. I'm not even sure how I would, I don't know what I would do. Like, there's, I don't have actions really that I can do. I can move the camera, move, jump, and spin attack, so. And I don't remember seeing any things that I could do anything with. Anyway, so that was, it looks like I'm basically done. I'm, afterwards I'm gonna go up, go on YouTube and just see what that is about. Uh, I don't feel like finding it myself, but anyways, that was a fun game. Uh, if this company makes, you know, where, when they make another game, I'm definitely gonna play it. Uh, I like these fun little, just simple games. I don't know, something about just, you know, something like this where, I know, it's kind of inspiring. It feels like, you know, I could do this maybe. You know, that's not to like talk down on them or anything, but it, you know, it's a couple levels, a simple character moving. There's not really any any enemies. This kind of makes me feel like, yeah, I could, uh, you know, one of these days, I could actually get around to making a game. I really should finish making a game sometime. Uh, I've started dozens, but I've never finished one. I, 
I just can't, uh, I've got too many ideas, I just get halfway through and then I decide, oh, actually this other idea would be much better and I start on it. Yeah, that was that was pretty fun. And uh, I guess I talked through all the games I played this year. Not not that many of them, but fairly good ones. <laughs>